Welcome to another episode of GTN Coaches Corner where we answer all your triathlon questions. In today's episode, we look at critical swim speed, adapting your run training to fit in triathlon, tracking your swim workout, how to rotate different run shoes, shoes and what is the 10% rule for increasing training. Right, let's get straight in to your questions. Starting with the address who says, GTN Coaches Corner, is there another swimming one to do to supplement is there another swimming one to do to supplement critical swim speed? The limitation of critical swim speed being simple arithmetic means that someone who swims a 10 minute 400 and a seven minute 200 will have a critical swim speed of 130. Similarly, someone who swims a six minute 400 and a three minute 200 will also have a critical swim speed of 130. However, the first person definitely cannot sustain 130 per 100 pace. I found my last few critical swim speed tests that because my 200 is slower, my critical swim speed has gotten faster than a rate I can actually sustain in my workouts. Okay, uh, critical swim speed, let's explain that first. Critical swim speed is essentially a calculation of what you could sustain for a, a sustained period for essentially 1500 meters or 1000 to 1500 meters of swimming. It is the swim speed that, that you can sustain, but obviously measuring that is really difficult. Uh, you can think of it much like an FTP test for the bike or your FTP for the bike, it would be your critical swim speed for the swim. Um, and again, like the bike, testing your FTP, which is what you can sustain for an hour of power, uh, is really hard because no one wants to go out and smash themselves for an hour. So we use shorter tests to estimate what your FTP would be. Similarly, with critical swim speed, we use shorter tests to estimate what you might be able to hold for a full 1500 meter. Were you going to do a 1500 meter time trial as hard as you can? Uh, now, to the question, Theadris says it doesn't work because his critical swim speed is faster than he can sustain. And now there's a bit of an, an issue here. He says it's simple arithmetic, but in his Example, it shouldn't actually be possible for someone to have swum a 200 meter time of seven minutes and a 400 meter time of 10 minutes. Uh, if you swim a 400 meter time of 10 minutes, you've essentially swum two 200s in five minutes. So you can't then say that your 200 meter time is seven minutes uh, because something's going wrong with the test. Uh, essentially, this is actually, well, this is not actually that uncommon. Uh, what your test should be is a 400 meter as hard as you can go once you're well warmed up, a time trial 400 meter, and then a full recovery, so a fair amount of time recovering, and then a 200 meter effort as hard as you can go. Now the issue with this and where it often goes wrong is with pacing. So if the address is swimming his 400 meter not very well, he's not pacing it very well, he's swimming way too hard in the first 200, dropping off really badly in the second 200, his overall time maybe maybe 10 minutes, uh, and then he's not recovering enough to do the 200 meter as well as he can, uh, and he's always pacing that badly too, uh, and he's going seven minutes for the 200, he's calculating it and he's getting it completely wrong. Uh, Essentially what you need to do is you need to do your 400, you need to pace it well, it needs to be well paced, you can't go really hard at the beginning and then drop off really badly, you need to pace it fairly well. You then need to take six to eight minutes, complete recovery, uh, you can do some active recovery to flush that lactic acid, and then you need to do 200 meters as hard as you can again, uh, and it should be a faster 200 meter time than either of the 200 meters were in your 400. Uh, and if you've done that, then you've done it correctly. If you can't do that correctly, it is a pacing issue and you need to try that test again when you're fresh again. Um, if this is, a, this is a constant issue for you and you can't get it right, there is one other option. It's not a great option, but you can do just a 1500 meter time trial. Literally just swim as hard as you can for 1500 meters and that will be your critical swim speed by definition. Uh, might not be what you want to hear, but I'm afraid that is the only accurate way to measure it. And then obviously, once you've got your critical swim speed, you can use that to set your zones for your other swimming, your, your goal paces for your other swimming. I hope that answers your question. Next question uh, from Woob, he says, hi guys, loving the advice. I got my first marathon in three and a half months, but it's also my first triathlon in six months, a very hilly 70.3. I'm pretty new to swimming and not a seasoned cyclist by any means. Which run should I sacrifice for my marathon prep to get at least one swim and two cycles per week? I plan to use them as cross training, but I'm going for a 310 marathon, so I'm unsure whether to drop some easy runs, tempo runs, or long runs. Okay, this is a bit of a tricky one. Uh, 
one swim and two cycles seems like a pretty good balance while you are preparing for that marathon. It is going to leave you a little bit behind in your swimming and cycling uh, when it comes to those last uh, two and a half months before the race, uh, but it is a good start. Um, you don't really want to drop your long run because that's vital for a marathon. Uh, what you can do, however, is maybe do two weekends where you do a long run and then the third weekend do a long ride and skip the long run. So you get two out of every three weeks a long run without completely sacrificing the long run um, because the long run is vital. You also don't want to drop the tempo work or the quality work because if you want to run a 310 marathon, you're going to have to do some quality and you need to get used to that goal pace. So dropping that is not a good idea. Um, you, your easy runs are mostly for aerobic gains and, and aerobic tolerance. So that can be more easily substituted for cycling and swimming because you will still get an aerobic benefit from those. Uh, so you're not losing as much by dropping those easy runs. Just make sure that your total weekly mileage isn't dropping too low uh, because you do need to still have a decent weekly mileage if you want to run a 310 marathon. Uh, but I think you're on the right track there with one swim, two cycles. Uh, and yeah, I would replace the easy stuff first. Essentially, the rule is triathletes don't really have much time for easy recovery sessions. Uh, it is all work. Uh, so yeah, start there and see how you go. I would swap your long, long run every two or three weeks uh, for a longer ride just so that your biking is not too far behind in those last two months when you do switch your focus to that 70.3. Okay, uh, now we have some questions on the 10% rule or increasing intensity. First, from Nialara Gulam, uh, I have a question. How much mile or distance is too much or too low to increase every week? How many miles or kilometers can I increase every week while still adapting and getting stronger? I would like to, uh, if you had these answers. And then Finn English says, a quick question about the 10% rule for increasing run volume. If you're planning your training and want to build speed work, hill reps, general elevation gain over the weeks, how should this be modified? I imagine we would increase the volume by less when we introduce these other aspects, but anything more specific or some rules of thumb? Thank you. Okay, so to answer both the questions at once, for those who don't know, the 10% rule is a general rule of thumb for how much you can increase your volume week on week without overreaching or overstraining yourself and allowing that adaptation to happen. It is a very general rule of thumb though. Um, to answer the second question, uh, how, how do you build in the intensity? The 10% in rule refers to volume or training load. It, it doesn't refer to mileage. So if you're increasing your mileage, uh, we, we use it, most people use it, to estimate uh, just their mileage because if they increase their mileage by 10% and they're all running at roughly the same pace, uh, they will be increasing their total volume by 10%. But if you're adding an intensive work like hill reps or high intensity work, uh, then your volume, uh, your training load, is actually going to be increasing by more than 10% if you're also adding 10% uh, to your mileage. So that is really the answer right there. It's about training load, and that is a 10% rule. So if you're gonna increase your mileage by 10%, then keep it roughly the same pace. If you're adding intensity or high intensity work or even hill reps or strength work, uh, then you have to reduce the mileage increase by a commensurate amount. So you can't also increase that by 10%. Uh, your training load shouldn't increase by more than 10%. So that answers the first person's question. 10% is the general rule. Uh, I would. If you've got time before your event, actually reduce that even further. 10% is the limit. Uh, you want to probably aim for about 5% if you have the time building up to your goal race. 10% uh, is the limit. It's the absolute top limit on how much you can add per week without risking injury or burnout. Um, just be careful you don't overwhelm your body. Reduce one or the other or both very gradually. Okay, Andrew Johnson asks, GTN Coaches Corner, what is the best way to keep track of your workout when on poolside? I don't like keeping my phone out and writing on paper only results in a mess. Hmm, yeah, I'd say a whiteboard. Yep, it's low tech, but it does work. Now, you can use a sports watch these days. They are pretty good these days at working out swimming. And if you set it to lap swimming, uh, it will actually probably disable the GPS and it will take into account, uh, they're smart enough to take into account the fact that you're stopping. They won't think that all your pauses are actually swimming time, uh, that you're stopping on the, at the end of lanes, at the end of reps. Uh, and then afterwards, you can go in to your, to your uh, training peaks or whatever software you use and adjust it, the distances to make sure you fit them in so that you know the total distance is correct. Um, 
failing using a sports watch, if you don't want to use a sports watch, then I would suggest you go low tech with a whiteboard. Uh, you get the small A4 whiteboards and a marker pen, you bring it with you, write your session out on that before you start leaving space in there to fill in your times and then at the end of each rep you can just quickly jot down one minute 30 or two minutes 45 or whatever it might have been uh, and then afterwards get out your smartphone, take a photo of that and upload it to your training log and you'll have a full log of exactly what you did and what times you did in your training log um, and without actually manually typing it all in. That is the best solution. Of course, paper and a pen can work, but it's very hard to write, uh, to write it on and even using a smartphone uh, with wet fingers is almost impossible. So uh, that's what I found works best if you need to record times and stuff for your swimming. Okay, Carl Jones asks, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. I currently have three pairs of running shoes on the go. A standard pair for zone one and two, intermediate level carbon pair for uh, tempo and threshold, and some meta speed scars for racing and super hard training efforts. My logic is that I don't need to wear out expensive shoes over many miles of training in zone one and two. Uh, when I do switch over to the faster shoes, I experience more of an obvious benefit. But this causes a discrepancy when setting pace zones based on data from running in fast shoes and also causes day-to-day -day fluctuations, fluctuations between workouts. Zone two in my fast shoes is as much as 15 seconds per kilometer faster than my standard shoes. It also skews my day-to-day -day fitness data on my watch. Um, I see many elite athletes appear to run in fast shoes all the time, uh, but then they do a lot of faster running than me. So if money was no object, is it better to train in all the same shoes all the time and maintain consistency, or are there benefits other than financial to doing easier work in normal shoes? I'm thinking of increased muscle recruitment, etc. Okay, this is an interesting one and it's worth discussing now that we have carbon shoes that are so much faster than other shoes. Uh, previously, you pretty much just trained in the best shoes for you all the time. I used to run in very lightweight uh, shoes pretty much all the time, my race shoes pretty much all the time. I would rotate multiple pairs and I would replace them really often and it was not a problem. Uh, but these days with the carbon shoes, it can be a bit more of an issue. So what's happening with the carbon shoes, uh, they are assisting you, these carbon super shoes, uh, and they're taking some of the strain off your arch, off your Achilles, off your calf, which is great for fast running. It's great for your pace on race day, uh, but it does lead to weakness in those muscles because they've been supported by a shoe. Uh, and over time, that weakness can lead to all kinds of issues. So you do wanna keep them strong, and the way you keep them strong is by challenging them with shoes that don't support them as much as in your cheaper shoes. Uh, so you do want to actually rotate shoes, you do want to swap shoes, you want to do exactly what uh, this this uh, Carl Jones is doing and use your cheaper shoes for the, for the slower runs and the easier runs and save your race shoes for high intensity sessions and race day itself. Um, but yeah, as he says, that brings in issues with pacing because your pace is gonna be so much faster uh, in your high intensity work when you're wearing the fast shoes and then your long runs are gonna seem really slow. I'm afraid there isn't actually an easy answer to this. In Training Peaks you can put in, in your training log, which shoe you ran in for that session, but I don't think it actually adjusts your pace zones based on that just yet. Maybe that's a feature they'll bring in in future. Um, but what you can do is base your zones more on heart rate than on pace. I mean, it's obviously nice to use pace as, you, as your zones, but you should probably be keeping an eye on your heart rate zones anyway, because on a day-to-day -day basis, your five minutes per K might be a lot harder one day than it was the previous day when you were fresh, or must be might be a lot easier if you've had a few days off, uh, and you're therefore not working exactly the same zone. Your heart rate's gonna be significantly lower on those easier days, even in the same shoes. So you should probably be keeping an eye on your heart rate and if you're using heart rate zones, uh, then the pace you're running is not so much of an issue. If you're 15 seconds per kilometer slower uh, on your long run than your, you would estimate, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you're in the right heart rate zone and therefore you're training the right energy systems for that session, then problem solved. Uh, yeah, as far as reconciling it for your training data and your training log, I'm afraid there's not much I can do other than to manually adjust it uh, after the fact. Uh, yeah, good luck with that, but I would say definitely keep uh, rotating those shoes. Keep using the, the worst shoes for your longer runs uh, and making sure you keep those lower leg muscles strong and don't always get the support of carbon blades. I hope that answered your question. I hope we have answered all your questions today. If you have your own questions, remember, leave them below this video. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. We'll pick them up and we could be answering them next week in GTN Coaches Corner. Thanks for watching.